<coughs> Cam, Jason, listeners, I want to start off by chastising Cameron for the lack of Cam-created dash cam videos recently. What's up with that? You owe us two videos this week, Cam. Get on it. Onto the subject of my video this week. I want to talk about something I don't usually talk about, and that's Mercedes-Benz. I'm not usually excited by Mercedes or their products, but in the 1950s they really had it together and created something that I find truly amazing. I'm gonna nerd out a little bit here, but bear with me. Following World War II, Mercedes was interested in a return to international motorsport after a decade and created the 300 SL. The SL was created by taking a large displacement inline six from their full-size sedan and dropping it into an aluminum tube frame race car. The concept had been done before, and it's been done many times since then, but it really worked, and they had a successful racer on their hands. The first 300 SLs, sport leaked, called W194s, were bulbous and round and beautiful coupes with very high door sills. The earliest cars had very small doors. There were a little more than windows that swung open to allow the drivers inside. Because of the safety rule set at Le Mans, they were forced to enlarge that opening and created the now iconic gullwing doors. In order to gain an advantage at Le Mans in 1952, Mercedes began investigating the realm of active aero. Active aero for motorsport purposes was likely influenced by the advancements in technology throughout the Second World War, especially as they pertain to airplanes. Because Le Mans had such long braking zones and such high speeds, Mercedes director of motorsports, Alfred Neubauer, initiated a program to look for a way of decreasing the strain on the car's drum brakes over the course of a 24-hour race. The idea came to fruition in the form of a roof-mounted airfoil that could be activated by the driver under extreme braking. The W194's carbureted engine only produced 175 horsepower, which was down on the competition, so the folks at Mercedes were forced to engineer an advantage where they could. The air brake was an effective way to both reduce the need to change brake friction material and to reduce braking distances, leading to faster lap times and less time in the pits. In testing, the W194's active air brake worked. It worked so well, in fact, that the drivers testing the car reported the steering going light when the system was active. Engineers who were watching the car at the braking zones even noted that the car would occasionally lift the front wheels off of the ground. Here's an interesting look at the patent information for the W194's air brake system. It's a little convoluted, but the holding system works much like that of an umbrella. The air brake is spring-loaded and when the detent is released the whole assembly tilts forward dramatically increasing the car's coefficient of drag. Needless to say after testing the idea was scrapped. Giving a driver a high-speed car with little to no steering under braking for several hours of racing is probably not the best idea. Following the W194 came the Formula One derived W196S 300 SLR, sport leaked Renin. More power was found in the form of a 3 liter inline 8, but the drum brakes were still a liability at Le Mans. For 1955, the idea of an air brake returned. Jaguar was coming to Le Mans with a sleek new D type featuring Dunlop designed disc brake systems, and Mercedes knew that they had to do something to stay ahead. Taking the idea to its zenith, a much larger air brake system was employed. The 1955 version of the air brake was a bit more sophisticated, essentially, using a 7.5 square foot sheet of lightweight aluminum as a net against the oncoming air. Again operated by the pilot, the large air brake was forced up into the airstream by a large hydraulic ram and could not be retracted again until the car slowed sufficiently. Forgetting to lower it actually cost the drivers several miles per hour in top speed. Sterling Moss left his open as he accelerated away from the Mulzahn corner in practice, and he found the acceleration so lacking that he thought he'd blown the motor. Here are some similar patent documents for the W196S air brake system. As you can see, the system is 100% hydraulically operated. Unlike the system on the W194, the airfoil sits down out of the air when not in use, and the system creates virtually no drag when the air brake is not extended. Mercedes 300 SLR was successful at the Mille Miglia in 1955, and looked like it could continue that success at Le Mans until tragedy struck. If you've ever studied motor racing history, you'll likely have heard of the tragedy that was Le Mans 1955. In case you haven't, I've included links below. It was because of that tragedy that all of Mercedes SLRs were pulled from the race, and the program was scuttled. Mercedes withdrew from all motor racing exercises, a policy which would last more than 30 years.
It's difficult to say what could have happened to the advancement of Active Arrow if that tragedy had not occurred. The science of aerodynamics in those days was still in its infancy. Many people didn't truly understand how the forces of air affected a racing car, and they would not, even for decades to come. If you know me, you probably know I'm a huge nerd for early aerodynamic advances, and I'll probably make more videos like this for other aerodynamic studies in future episodes. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and be sure to listen to the Camden Tubbed podcast every Friday morning at 7.30 Pacific, only on Hooniverse.com.